Welcome everyone to this talk by Robert Edmonds about DNS in Debian. Hello, can you hear me? All right, so uh, just get started. Um, so what exactly is uh, the DNS? Um, this, th these uh, four definitions are from a uh, pending RFC draft and they're really quite opaque definitions. Um, they're you know, very uh, jargon-filled, and they're sort, of, um, they're sort of definitions by DNS protocol geeks uh, for other DNS protocol geeks. And, and so the, to an application developer, you know, someone who just wants to use the DNS incidentally, these are uh, very lofty definitions. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read, them, read them all out. I mean, they're, uh, you know, uh, so, so um, Here's my second slide. Um, the DNS, you know, the more nuts and bolts uh, definition. Um, the DNS, uh, you know, dates back to this, you know, the early 80s, you know, this, this early experimental era of the internet. And it sort of co-evolved with the other early protocols from that era, like SMTP. And, uh, the, you know, the big, uh, you know, reason for it was sort of to uh, to move this static configuration data into you know they didn't call it the cloud then but they were uh, uh, taking you know static you know the hosts.txt file uh, there was a lot of um, really weird stuff around around mail uh, at, in in this you know this era and and this eventually evolves you know forward and it's now you know now used by every you know every operating system that you know connects to the internet and obviously you know including Debian. Um, most DNS talks, uh, they sort of focus on this infrastructure side. You know, this is this jargon-filled side of the DNS where you have, you know, terms like recursion, delegation, zones, servers, you know. Uh, but this talk is, is going to, you know, focus more on the application side. You know, we're also going to talk about the infrastructure, but I'm, uh, I wanted to make this talk more general and uh, talk about programs that actually want to make use of the data in the DNS rather than you know the the, the plumbing of the DNS, and uh, specifically how you know how does the DNS satisfy you know these application needs. Um, here's what the uh, DNS architecture looks like if we you know oversimplify it you know and you know put it in these boxes and diagrams. Um, on the top row we have you know the jargon. Um, uh, and towards the you know left left side of the diagram, we have you know more application focused uh, parts of the architecture. Toward the right hand side, you know you have more uh, infrastructure focused stuff. Uh, so on a, a Debian machine, um, every Debian ma every Debian machine has a stub resolver, has applications that that talk to that stub resolver. You know want to do DNS lookups, um, and those those uh, stub resolvers then have to um, you know, send a send a DNS query to uh, an upstream uh, name server, a recursive server. Um, you know, the name server option in your resolve.conf file, um, and these recursive servers actually have the you know the full algorithm and, and data and, and cache to uh, be able to talk to um, the actual authoritative name servers on the internet where the you know the zone data is stored. So uh, these you know these green arrows are DNS queries going over the network. Uh, these red arrows are the you know the responses coming back, um, and if, you know the end goal uh, for the you know the system as a whole is to get this this zone data uh, over on the right hand side, you know back to the application, and you know the application is it's going to want to do um, you know look up a host name so it can make a TCP connection or you know send email that kind of stuff. Um, the DNS uh, data model. Um, is, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple, it's a, it's a really, it's a super simple, uh, you know, RPC almost. Um, you know, it's got one method, which is to uh, look, up, look up a key, you know, get a set of values back. Um, it's actually a, a sort of a tuple, a key and a type. Um, and we have uh, various, uh, you know, restrictions on, on these, um, you know, these parts of the data model. You know, keys have to be, uh, less than 255 bytes, and there's various syntax restrictions. Uh, type is a 16-bit integer, um, and there are a number of you know well-defined um, 
types uh, that have uh, mnemonics uh, for them. So type one is the, you know the A type. Type twenty eight is uh, the quad A. Uh, these you know these familiar uh, well known mnemonics. And values technically have a, a, a limit of you know up to sixty four k of data. Um, and the the actual you know layout on the wire for these these values is uh, usually rigidly defined by the you know specification documents. Um, in practice, uh, there's actually very few uh, actual well-known types. I believe there's fewer than 100 out of a uh, you know 64k. Um, and most most uh, creative uses of the DNS, uh, they tend to reuse an existing type rather than you know go off and, and arbitrarily define their their own types. Um, and I believe part of this is is um, uh, due to the you know existing. APIs and, and uh, you know limitations that we've we've built up over the years. Um, here, here we have some uh, you know trivial ex examples of uh, taking you know a key and a type and getting back a, a set of values. Um, you know you have you know a and quad a MX records. Uh, they you know here here and here we've you know basically this is just the uh, the documentation examples. Um, so. Getting into application use uh, of the DNS in Debian, um, you know, I've looked at, um, you know, not exhaustively, uh, of course, um, but there, there's a, a, you know, a lot of software in Debian that uses the, the DNS. And I sort of, I mostly ordered them, you know, in, you know, reverse uh, popularity, um, I guess. Uh, most common uh, way, uh, that you know, most most applications use to uh, to look up data in the DNS is uh, through this uh, function called get adder info. Um, usually, uh, they don't uh, actually care that the DNS is is uh, actually returning these uh, you know the data it's looking for, uh, which is a good thing actually um, for things like uh, address family independence. You know, if you want we, we want applications to you know work transparently on IPv4 or IPv6. The application shouldn't be specifically selecting a particular you know A or quad A uh, Q type. Um, so this is probably the, the wrong uh, interface that you would want to use um, if your goal were to um, interact with the DNS data model per se. Uh, and 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 most. Most applications actually want to, you know, they're actually doing host name lookups, and this is the right interface for them. Um, but there's a, you know, there's another big drawback to this this interface is that it's a uh, blocking interface, which is okay for, you know, uh, the you know command line ping wget uh, type applications. It's very bad for, uh, app, you know, things like web browsers that need to uh, be highly concurrent, and highly, uh, highly re responsive. Um, there's no standard asynchronous. Uh, Get adder info uh, version. Um, the plumbing for this interface is uh, kind of interesting. If you've never heard of it before, the uh, the name service switch is um, this sort of uh, interesting abstraction layer deep in the uh, C library, glibc. Um, you can run uh, the get adder info function itself with this uh, command line driver called uh, git int. Um, Usually, in Etsy nsswitch.conf, you'll have a hosts line, and it will have a um, one or more uh, parameters. And almost everyone has at least DNS. Uh, this is the default that we've you know always used you know for years and years. Uh, that actually goes out and does DNS lookups and puts them into um, uh, you know returns them through the uh, the get adder info in interface. Um, there is a alternative. Uh, NSS, uh, NSS module that also does DNS lookups. It's not actually in Debian yet, um, which is uh, one called Resolve, which may be in the future provided by System D. Um, and the this this DNS NSS module uh, is essentially an adapter uh, between you know this this front end uh, get adder info. Uh, porcelain and this uh, the back end the actual DNS uh, plumbing, which is provided by a, a library called libresolve, which is shipped in in glibc. Um, and then we have uh, uh, resolve, uh, which is the you know the system D, you 
you know, rewrite, you know, the, the future replacement uh, or future option. Um, and it, it can, it, can uh, it also does DNS, uh, but it also implements a couple of other um, DNS-like uh, protocols like M MDNS and something called LLMNR. Um, and this is, um, it actually offers a, a DBUS uh, type implementation. Uh, the second uh, option uh, for an application is to directly call into uh, LibResolve, which is this uh, glibc library, um, which was actually imported from a very old bind, very old versions of Bind in the uh, early, starting in the early 90s, and it looks like the last actual merge was uh, in you know 15 years ago uh, from Bind 8. Uh, other OSs have also um, you know, imported uh, this code, uh, BSD variants, uh, obviously, uh, Slaris, I believe. Um, this is this is qu quite an old old, old bit of code, um, but it's, the interface is really low level, and uh, some of them are documented, uh, some of them are not. Um, probably the best reference is actually in a uh, an actual book called DNS and Bind uh, from O'Reilly. Um, but this is uh, these these inter interfaces are pretty low level and you know require a, a fair bit of, of, of mastery of, of the DNS uh, protocol. So um, I, 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 there's actually you know a lot fewer uses of, of LibResolve than 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 Git or info in the archive. Uh, there are a couple of good examples. Uh, one is uh, Postfix, uh, which uses go which uses both Git adder info and uh, LibResolve. Uh, uses get adder info, which is the proper interface to use for um, making you know socket connections to you know SMTP peers, um, but also uses LibResolve uh, for a variety of other um, uh, uses. Uh, a a mail transfer agent, a you know a modern uh, mail transfer agent, uh, typically is going to do a lot more than just uh, A and even just A and MX. It also uh, has to um, you know it, 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 it interacts. At a level uh, with the DNS that is requires these is the slower level uh, LibResolve interface. Um, there's a program called RapServe uh, which I wrote, um, uh, which uses LibResolve exclusively. And my experience with this program is that um, people probably shouldn't have to use LibResolve uh, if they want to interact with the DNS. Uh, the third option is uh, third-party libraries. Um, so if you have a, 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 a use case that can't be served by, you know, the general purpose get or info interface, and you're not a big fan of uh, LibResolve's, you know, very low-level, um, uh, you know, l very low-level, uh, very, you know, crufty interface, you might want to consider a more modern uh, third-party library, um, especially um, if your, your use case requires a lot of uh, asynchrony. And if we look at um, actually, oh, let's skip ahead. Uh, if you look at the available third-party libraries that do DNS lookups, a lot of them are, are you know, we have uh, ADNS, uh, CREs, LibEvent, and LibUV, LibUV, which are almost, you know, they're, they're, they're very uh, focused on the uh, asynchronous use case, almost to the exclusion of um, uh, other opportunities that uh, are offered by the the DNS data model. Uh, the big, the big 800-pound gorilla uh, of third-party DNS libraries is something called LDNS. Um, it's fairly comprehensive. Um, if you look at the symbol table of the library, it has over 800 uh, public symbols. Uh, these are, you know, just functions. This is a ridiculously large library. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's. If you're if you're if you're building DNS servers, uh, this is probably the library you want to use. It's it's probably actually over, overkill uh, for a lot of um, more simpler uses. Um, this is a C library. It does have uh, Python bindings, uh, but they're Swig based, and I've, I've never been able to figure them out. Um, there's another library called LibUnbound, which is uh, also from the same vendor as, as LibLDNS. And it's sort of like putting an uh, uh, an unbound server inside your application and running it. Um, it's and, you know, Unbound is a fairly lightweight DNS server, but embedding the whole thing into your application is, is a fairly uh, heavyweight thing to do. Um, if you absolutely need, you know, DNSSEC validation inside your process, you need, uh, if you need async, asynchrony, asynchrony 
uh, caching. Uh, this is probably what you probably the uh, third party library what you that you want to use. It's also got um, a Swig based Python binding. Um, and Git DNS is another option. Um, this is probably the most recent and uh, most comprehensive uh, attempt at, at, at this application use case. Um, and it's in, intentionally uh, focusing on this, this uh, porcelain, the you know, DNS porcelain for uh, application programmers. Uh, it's got a nice uh, modern uh, API. Uh, it's got async support. Um, they've taken a fairly formal approach and split it into a, uh, an API specification and a reference implementation of that specification. And ideally, in the future, there will be additional uh, conforming implementations of that, of that spec uh, you know, with, with API compatibility. Uh, there is a Python binding, and uh, I found it was not Swig-based, so I suspect I'll be able to learn it. Uh, it's very new. It's not in, in Debian stable. Um, so uh, that's you know, pretty modern, I guess. Uh, that would be still be called stable backports, so yeah, you know, so. yeah uh, of course. Um, let me look at that one previously. Um, fourth option is the, the comedy option: is, is just do everything yourself, and 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 just you know, none of the avail available options suit you. Uh, just just do everything yourself, and and uh, uh, integrate it directly into your source tree. Uh, Chromium browser um, does that, and. You know, it's a web browser, and it's it's got a you know makes certain demands of the of the network. Uh, it requires a you know the vendor has decided it requires a, a very very great control over the DNS uh, resolution process. Um, here's our summary of these four options: um, get out our info. Uh, you know, it's got low flexibility, uh, but it's you know it's very portable, available everywhere. Uh, and then you go up to LibResolve. Uh, you go to additional complexity, um, but it's more low level. A um, lot of OSs have it, uh, though you probably have to adjust your uh, your build system to be able to, to access it. Because um, it has, you know, goes by different names on, on different platforms. Um, and a third party library is going to give you the most flexibility because you can you know, obviously select whichever one is, whichever one you like best. Um, it's obviously going to introduce an extra dependency. Uh, in your application, um, you know, do it yourself, you know, frowny face. Um, so let's switch gears a bit and uh, talk about uh, security and switch over a bit to the uh, infrastructure side of the DNS. Uh, we have this classic uh, information security triad of um, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability. If you've not heard of this uh, concept before, you can I don't know, uh, check out the Wikipedia article on it, I guess. Um, but there's these uh, these uh, classic um, uh, properties of uh, of security um, within the DNS uh, security. Uh, the approach to security has, has traditionally been on integrity. Uh, you want to prevent um, malicious servers from being able to just you know in, you know poison your your, your cache uh, with anything they want, and uh, that. Uh, a lot of work went into that uh, problem in the uh, 90s, and there's a um, there's a, a you know a formal ranking of trustworthiness of based on where you uh, where the data came from, how uh, whether it outranks a, another source of data or not. Um, those were non-cryptographic rules, and and people started realizing it'd be good to be able to uh, cryptographically authenticate the data as well. That would be the uh, ultimate tier of uh, uh, trustworthiness. Um, so this work got started, you know, early mid '90s or so, um, and then a lot of years passed. And they completed the core specifications around 2005, um, and they actually kept making more specifications after that, um, uh, which eventually uh, culminated, you know, after a number of years of uh, policy and governance stuff, in the actual signing of the uh, the root DNS zone. Uh, with a DNSSEC key, um, that's trickled down uh, to you know secure delegations to a lot of uh, you know GTLDs and CCT CCTLDs that now support DNSSEC, and the the new um, ICANN new GTLD program mandates that uh, all all of these new GTLDs must offer uh, DNSSEC support. Um, so the uh, 
number of uh, TLDs, TLDs that support DNSSEC is now kind of uh, lopsided uh, due to that uh, explosion. Um, some protocols, uh, like HTTP, um, don't currently make a significant use of DNSSEC. Uh, the vendors of uh, browsers have decided to focus on um, uh, more TLS-oriented uh, security measures, you know, things like uh, HTTP, you know, strict transport security, uh, you know, and a variety of other uh, uh, ways to, you know, communicate uh, the fact, you know, uh, to be able to, you know, securely um, distribute not just authentic data, but, you know, uh, cryptic, you know, the ability to get, um, you know, cryptographically private communications between uh, uh, between endpoints. And the problem with DNSSEC here is that it, it only offers authentic uh, data, you know, authentic signing of, of uh, these DNS records uh, that are used to, to, to make uh, HTTP connections. Um, however, if you look at other protocols, uh, like SMTP, uh, SMTP actually has a much better uh, use case for implementing DNSSEC support. Um, and the reason is uh, this um, level of um, indirection in the MX record. Uh, so the MX record you know, d determines where your, your mail goes. It lists the, the mail exchanger, the, uh, the destinations for um, you know, SMTP message. Uh, and and the, the MX records uh, actually uh, don't tell you the addresses of the, of the SMTP server. They give you a, a, a name, you know, a list of names of, of other servers. Um, and these, these uh, resource records aren't actually uh, authentic. So if you actually validate the, the TLS certificate of the SMTP server that you connect to, um, the way that you would do that is usually based on you know, the common name uh, field in that certificate. And uh, the value for that is entirely controlled by the MX record, which is unauthenticated. So this is a totally worthless thing to do if you're, if you're getting, uh, you know, potentially uh, poisonous uh, data back from, from the DNS. So the, uh, uh, I think PostFix is, is a really gung-ho on, on DNSSEC. If you look at the, the latest versions, they've got um, a significant amount of uh, uh, new functionality. If you look at the... Uh, the TLS documentation uh, for PostFix. Um, if you look specifically at DNSSEC and Debian, um, we, we were using this, uh, this old uh, GLibc stub resolver you know, from the 90s. You know, it's, it's been maintained since then, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not seen you know, a, an, o an overhaul uh, that would allow it to, to uh, easily support DNSSEC. And the, the way uh, most, you know, most you know wiki type, you know tutorial type guides uh, get around this fact that there's no, you know, validating stub resolvers. Is they just recommend installing a uh, a local DNS server. Um, so if you if you can't uh, if your client doesn't support security, just just install a, a local server uh, on your machine and just point the client directly to that that local host uh, uh, server. Um, and that's the direction that Fedora seems to be moving in. Um, they've got a uh, proposal there to. Uh, do that by default, and the big problem with this is that if you're uh, if you're on a network that um, causes DNSSEC to fail, you don't want to, you know, not be able to browse anything. So there's a uh, a, a utility called DNSSEC trigger. So uh, Fedora has got a you know a significant amount of uh, um, you know, this this DNSSEC trigger uh, machinery and integration work that they've been doing to uh, try to get this um, uh, DNSSEC by default uh, goal in their platform. Um, so an open question here is, is, should we have something like that uh, perhaps as an, an installation option in Debian? Um, I'm kind of, kind of you know, I, I'm, I'm a maintainer of the uh, Unbound package. Um, and Unbound, if you install it, it will, you know, by default give you a, a, a DNSSEC server. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it, it's, I, I've been using it for a number of years, and, and it's a, uh, you know, it's uh, my currently preferred uh, validating DNSSEC server. Um, and, you know, it's possible that a this could be an option. I don't. I don't think I would recommend it as a uh, um, something you enable by default um, and you know uh, anytime soon. Uh, I think we should you know wait and see what you know how this works out in uh, Fedora and move appropriately. I guess. Um, uh, in in Debian, 
Uh, we also have a package called DNS root data. Uh, and this uh, package um, is it, basically a, a, just a data package. Uh, it's sort of it's very roughly like the CA certificates package. Um, it's got uh, copies of uh, these, these parameters called the root zone hints and the root trust anchor uh, that control um, where the, sorry? Okay. Um, so, so there's, there's these uh, parameters in, in the, uh, the, the, this, this package. Um, some of the stuff gets hard coded into uh, various DNS servers and, and uh, software. Um, and if there, if we add even more, you know, DNSSEC libraries, uh, we might want to uh, have this centralized um, uh, to reduce the pain of uh, of these uh, these rollovers. Okay, I guess that's the end of the time slot. <laughs>